Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast, Episode 570, Obesity is the Biggest Threat to Being Healthy in the U.S. BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about anti-aging medicine. Your host is Dr. Kathy Moffat, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging. Dr. Maupin is the author of The Secret Female Hormone, the seminal work about testosterone replacement therapy for women, and Got Testosterone, the award-winning book for men that helps men choose the most effective and safe form of testosterone replacement. These books are available on Amazon or from Dr. Maupin's office at BioBalance Health in St. Louis and in Kansas City. Dr. Maupin's office is currently accepting new patients. Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast. I'm Dr. Kathy Maupin, and today we're going to talk about a difficult subject. It's a subject that bothers many Americans and many people across the globe, and that is obesity. WHO has now said that there are more people on this planet who are obese than are malnourished. That was a, an amazing fact to me, and one that is somewhat disturbing. Now we are uh, causing illness because we have too much plenty, too much food. Four million people across the globe are dying each year as a result of being overweight or obese. That was before 2020 and the pandemic. It got worse over the pandemic. In um, 2016, 1.9 1.9 billion people were obese. So this is a medical problem. I think one of the other problems that keep us from talking about this is that there is a faction of people who say talking about obesity is fat shaming. Now let me just say that as a child, when I grew up with a father who thought anybody who wasn't Twiggy was fat, and he shamed me all the time, And I know what that feels like, and that's not what I'm doing here. We are talking about obesity as a problem, as a health problem, and a societal problem, and one that we should be working actively to fix, prevent, change our lifestyles, change how we advertise, change how we think about eating. Because eating is really fuel. That's what it's for, and it's for social contact. Eating is not for sitting in the back of of mom's uh, wagoneer and stuffing a hamburger in your face. That is not what eating is about. So I was, um, this was made poignant to me when I had a couple come in from Denmark right before the pandemic. They were, they had never been to America. They were tiny. They were shorter than me and very thin and very fit looking. They were always very careful about their diet. I interviewed them about that. But when we were done talking about hormones and and, uh, their treatment, they said, we have some questions for you about America. They said, we were at our hotel and we walked over to a grocery store to get some grapes and some fresh fruit. And we found that when we walked into your grocery store, everybody was huge. They were obese. They were, they, they were twice our size, and they, they all were eating. The second problem was they were all eating processed foods. No one had fruit in their cart. No one had fresh vegetables. They were, and that means the majority. They had sodas. They had, they had all this stuff in plastic, all these fast meals. I, they couldn't believe it because where they come from, which is a tiny country and is, is a very tight knit country. People live in, in cities and, and areas where they can actually walk to things. Their whole world is around grocery stores and, and bakeries and you can walk to get your food. You can walk to go out to dinner. You can walk for entertainment, and they have rapid transit. But this was one of those things that they said, is this, is this America? And I said, yeah, this is America. Because in America, we are getting fatter every single year. So 
the other, the other issue that I do want to interject here is that the reason they came to America and the good part about America is that they're from a socialized medicine country. Their government controls everything that you can import. You can't import medications. And you can, and your medicine is determined by the government, whether you can get that medicine or not. Doesn't matter if you're dying or what, or whatever, or if you need it for hormones. They don't acknowledge that hormones are necessary, um, especially natural estrogen and especially pellets. So they don't, they don't have compounding pharmacies. America, we have choices. And they came to America to get their medical care because there are no choices there. And they were not feeling better with what they were offered, or they weren't offered anything. So that's a problem with socialized medicine that you need to keep in the back of your mind when we're talking about, oh, this is great, everybody will have Medicare. Well, then they'll cut out what we can get because we can't afford to give everyone Medicare. In any case, this is why they were here and for me to treat them. Then we tried to send them follow-up medications. Um, I... T they found a doctor who would do their pellets if I instructed him. They, we tried to send them that kind of thing and, or gels or creams or something to help get them along while they were, in, um, they were, uh, quarantined with COVID. They took it away at the border. They threw it out. So they never did receive what we sent them. So this is something I, I just want you to put in the back of your mind while we're talking about a whole different subject. So they, they, were, they were somewhat appalled by our lifestyle and our, um, the things that we think are normal. Now, I tried to explain to them that America is really s spread out, that we have all these huge opportunities, but you have to drive to them. But they also noticed that people fought for parking places so that they could just be close enough to the grocery store, they wouldn't have to walk very far, that type of thing. And they were kind of amazed at that because they walk everywhere. In any case, um, this being obese is a huge problem. One of the, thing, one of the statistics um, that I saw was that uh, in America... We have gone, we have increased the obesity rate since 2010 by 14 percent. 14 percent more people are obese now, are obese in 2020 than were in 2010. And nothing's really changed except, I guess, we're eating more junk and we're not cooking and we're driving our kids everywhere so that they can exercise, but we're not exercising. We don't have exercise in our, in our, um, uh, in our daily plan. I mean, we don't have it penciled in so that we exercise every day. And to be normal weight, you actually do have to exercise every day. You can, when people come to me and they say, well, normal daily activity is exercise, well, maybe a hundred years ago, when you when you scrubbed your floor on, you know, with on your hands and knees with a cloth or a mop, and you you didn't have vacuum cleaners, and you hit the rugs outside, but that's not the case now. Now everything is so easy; we don't even wash our own dishes, so we just turn a machine on. So we normal daily activity for someone who stays at home and takes care of the house and kids is not a lot of physical activity. I like using. Um, Apple watches to tell me if I've gotten enough activity that day so that I, I can add something on at the end of the day. It also gives me reinforcement when I do exercise and get plenty of, ac of uh, activity and um, I can even put my food into it. We have um, software that you can use to calculate all of the, um, all of the calories that you eat. So uh, this is something that I think is very, very important, and I think that we need to think, we need to consider obesity as a problem. Okay, so you say, okay, it's America. We're free. We're free to eat all we want. We're free to not exercise. We're free to do whatever we want. It doesn't impact anyone else. Well, yes, it does. Here's how. 
If you've ever been on a bus or an airplane and you sat next to somebody who was whose fat came over to your body, no matter how far you scooted to one side or the other, to give them more room, they're, they are using a third of your seat. And that encroaches on your ability to sit there comfortably. You bought a seat, right? But because they are obese, they can't sit in that seat. Now, let me just tell you, my, I'm married to a six foot four, 225 man. He doesn't spread this way. He's, he is fit, but his legs don't fit. So we have to pay for extra leg room or we pay for business class or we pay for something so he can comfortably sit and not encroach on somebody else's seat. That's very important, but we don't ask people who are obese to pay for two seats. That's not fair. And it's not fair to the person who paid for this seat. So it does affect you. If you are not obese, it affects you if you are obese. Um, second of all, nobody ever talked about the fact that most people who had severe COVID were obese because they were, they were sick, but that was because they were obese to begin with. Now, that doesn't mean it's anybody's fault, but it has affected all of us. The more people who got COVID, the more people before we had an immunization, the more people who had COVID and who had uh, complicating illnesses shut our country down. What if we were all fit? Maybe we wouldn't have had as much quarantine, or maybe we wouldn't have been shut down as long. Maybe we wouldn't have as many diseases to deal with, such as diabetes, heart disease, um, some autoimmune diseases. Many of the diseases that we deal with on a daily basis in doctor's offices are first a disease of obesity. So, and on that, let me interject that talking about losing weight is futile to most doctors. People don't listen and don't do what you ask them to do, of course. They just eat what they want, and then they come back and say, you know, why didn't I lose weight? So most doctors aren't going to even talk to you about it. They're going to say either make an appointment for a long weight loss consult with my nurse or with me, or they're going to say, yeah, you're not going to do it anyway, see ya. Because they're frustrated too. And God forbid your doctor might be obese too. So that's... That's something that is why doctors aren't dealing with it, is because they've been beating their head against the wall trying to get people to lose weight. And sometimes we can't get people to lose weight. It is one of those, it is one of those things that either you have to be, you have to know why you're getting, uh, having weight loss and why you're not eating, drinking sodas with uh, corn syrup in it or why you're not um, eating five pieces of pizza at 450 calories a piece. I mean, you have to actually know what part of your activity is causing you to be obese before you can actually change your lifestyle. And it's mostly lifestyle. So the other thing is your insurance is going up every year. This 14% increase in 10 years for obesity is increasing your dollar amount of what your employer or you are paying, or it is making you pay more of the, of the cost of your insurance, even if you're normal weight. So they don't say, oh yeah, because you're normal weight, you don't have to pay that much. So it does affect everyone. And you need to, you need to think about your life and do you want to affect other people that way? Or you need to encourage the people in your life and help them lose weight. One of the other things is that so many illnesses are attached to obesity and the, the rapid increase of obesity is outstripping the uh, speed of advances in medicine to fix those things. So I used to, I used to uh, tell my father because he didn't have obesity, but he had other issues. And he used to say, ah, so what? I'm not, I'm not doing anything about that. I'll just die. Well, let me tell all of those of you who say that, that you don't just get to die. I mean, if you think that's your way out, you actually have pain, suffering, miserable, a miserable life, and you spend most of your time in doctor's offices. No one wants to do that. And the, 
and then maybe when you're when you hit the limit of time where you're suffering, maybe then you're saved from this life by dying. But it isn't as easy as saying, "Oh yeah, I'm going to do this habit, and then I'm just going to die." That's not an answer to this, and I don't like to hear that in my in my office. One of the things I will say is how we look at obesity is a little different then we should be looking at it. We use something called a BMI. A BMI is an easy way to tell if somebody is overweight, but it is not accurate. So yes, maybe some of these folks who are called obese aren't, but what they're looking at is height and weight. That should be a good, a good uh, estimate of whether you're overweight or not, but... Height and weight don't tell the story. We use a, uh, an in-body machine that tells you how much muscle you have, how much fat you have. I mean, you can be at a perfect height and weight and be all fat. Well, that's not healthy either when you have no muscle. So you can have a lot of muscle and be really healthy and look like your BMI is high. So they give us, just for your, just for your information, the government tells us that if you are 25 to 30, then you're normal weight. If your BMI is over 30, then you're obese. Then over 40, then you're, you're uh, severely obese. So yes, that's a, an estimate, but if you have a lot of muscle and not a lot of fat, then muscle weighs a lot and you're usually compact. I mean, I have that issue. I have a lot of muscle. I weigh 133 pounds and I'm 5'3". So they put me at the top of the, the under 25, or uh, excuse me, under 30 BMI, I'm, I'm like 27. So, but I'm not obese, and I have a lot of muscle, and my size is low, uh, dress size is low. But I have to watch that every single day. If I um, eat improperly, God forbid I eat fast food, uh, but when we're traveling, I have to eat fast food because... What, what are you going to do? You're on, the, you're on the road, you're traveling across the country, and you have to stop, and you don't want to sit down and have a meal for an hour and a half. So usually you stop and get something. And I literally don't exercise while I'm traveling in a car, so I end up gaining weight before I get to my destination because fast food is not what I eat every day, and it is not good for you, and it has tons of calories. So we are... Um, on that subject, next week we're going to talk about the different fast foods and all of the calories that it has, and it's mostly carbohydrate calories, which is another issue. But fast food is one of the reasons that uh, people in America are trying to save time, and they are gaining weight every time they have it. And God forbid you go to Starbucks, coffee by itself, a coffee with nothing in it is zero calories. If you think you're having zero calories, when you have a venti uh, mocha, you're eating, you're eating a meal. I mean, it is 400 to 600 calories. You might as well eat eggs and bacon at home. So this is not free, f free food. Coffee is not free food if it has something in it. So you need to, we use all of these, we use all of these excuses to do what tastes good, what feels good, and, that, and avoid having to cook at home, which is a lot of work. But if you plan it, and it won't be as expensive as eating junk food or eating out, and if you plan it over a week, you can actually eat good food every night without a lot of effort. I mean, I did that for years even when I was a gynecologist, and then my husband cooks now, and he does that. And we eat fresh food, fresh meat. We, we don't eat junk, and we don't eat dessert. So... What, I'm going to leave you with this scenario. When I sit down with my patients, I'm not just giving them hormones. I'm not just, uh, just trying to treat their low T and low estrogen symptoms. I'm trying to get them healthier. If I have an alcoholic, I have to talk to them about alcohol and tell them they'll never be healthy unless they are no longer drinking alcohol. If I talk to somebody who drinks four four big sugared sodas a day, I have to tell them that that is out. If they want to lose weight and be healthy, 
they cannot drink those. I literally have women sit in front of me and cry like they lost their best friend. This is not your best friend. Food is not your best friend. Your, your people, your family, your friends are your best friend. And this is not necessary, but you become addicted to these things. And sugared sodas should not even be sold in my mind because they are worthless. They're not food. I mean, it kind of goes with alcohol. They're not really helping you in any way. Uh, but in moderation, anything can be, uh, can be, um, uh, eaten or drank, but I, we're just killing ourselves with our diet. So I think you should look at this week, write down everything you eat, write down every single thing you eat and drink and including alcohol, including water, and then all what you, how you exercise. You're not going to burn more than 2000 calories a day. So if you're eating more than 2000 calories a day, you're gaining weight and you're gaining fat because without exercise, you're not going to gain muscle. So do that for me. Next week, we are going to talk about some of the other lifestyle things, changes that you can make to make your fight against obesity easier. So please join us next week. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth.